don't know if it's going to restart. Anyway, so I'm just going to, my notes from my computer, and my computer died, so I may just have to wing it. Um, all right, so there's a certain kind of boredom that I have in this topic because um, we say these things over and over again, and unfortunately, you know, nothing ever seems to change when it comes to Pakistan and U.S. policy towards it, particularly in the post-9-11 period. What's up? All right, cool. Um, so, and I, and, I, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, nothing's going to change either under President Trump. Um, he, he can tweet whatever he wants, but, and he will do that. Um, but there is a, a very serious constraint to what he or any other U.S. president wants to do in Afghanistan, and that's logistics. Any logisticians here from the military? Anyone? So, you know, we can, we can obsess over the number of troops that we have in Afghanistan. We can obsess over what their mission is going to be. Is it going to be counterinsurgency? Is it going to be counterterrorism? But there'll be none of those missions if we don't have a way to logistically resupply our troops in Afghanistan. And you know, for the last, uh, how many years has it been? I think the, the global war on terrorism is old enough to drive now. Um, for years, I have heard Indians say, why is the US giving Pakistan so much money, right? And I think right now we're up to something like $34 billion in counting. Well, and the reason's very simple. We need access to Afghanistan's air, or excuse me, access to Pakistan's ground lines of communication, and we need specifically access to Pakistan's airspace or the air lines of communication to sustain our presence and that of our partners in Afghanistan. Right? This is overdetermined by this thing called a map. So we learned in 2011 when the Pakistanis closed down the G-locks that the northern distribution route is complete nonsense. And you can see why the northern distribution route is complete nonsense if you look at a map. We still need to have a port, and once things are offloaded at a port, they then have to be uh, transported over land, back through another sea, back to land, and down through Afghanistan, and, and depending upon which route, traversing multiple countries, and these countries are largely influenced by Russia, and in case you haven't been paying attention, our relationship with Russia is actually pretty constrained. And one of the ports that would have been used in this northern distribution route is in Turkey. Our relations with Turkey are also not so fabulous. Now, had Hillary Clinton actually been the president, and actually she did win the popular vote, it was the slave state college that made the uh, the sexual assailant uh, in chief that's presently occupying the White House, the president, we would have been able to capitalize upon the opening with Iran, right? And uh, Indians know full well that, you know, India has invested quite a bit in Chabahar. India, in the last few months, recently demonstrated the efficacy of this alternative ground line of communication by, by moving several thousand tons of wheat into Afghanistan. But of course, Trump, and I won't use the, the preface president, what Trump has done largely under the influence of Israel has done everything it can to sabotage this Iran agreement. For whatever reason, Trump seems persuaded that Iran is more dangerous than Pakistan, even though all of the evidence would, would undermine that sort of assertion. And so this puts India, I think, in a really interesting space because India has good relations with Iran, India has also very good uh, relations with Israel. From my point of view, as an analyst of South Asia, I don't understand why we are carrying water for Israel. Israel has no troops in Afghanistan. Israel has nothing to do with the Afghan conflict, yet we are pursuing a policy that undermines our own strategic interests for reasons that are not even clear to me, right? So this is, I think India has an important role to sort of interlocute about the importance of the JCPOA. Because I assure you, under Netanyahu's pressure, Trump is going to do everything he can to undo the JCPOA. That's why he got rid of uh, Rex Tillerson, right? And he knows that Pompeo, that he hopes is gonna get confirmed, is very much in alignment with his thinking about the Iran deal. But without an alternative way of getting into Afghanistan, 
you're not going to see any change in U.S. policy towards Pakistan. And so you're essentially um, imposing a choice upon the United States, right, which neither choice has outcomes that are terribly preferable for India, right? If we leave Afghanistan, we know exactly what's going to happen, right? We're going to be pretty much where we were on September 10th, 2001, at some point in the future. But if we continue staying on in Afghanistan, we have to continue placating Pakistan, right? And so this is, this is the geographical puzzle that we're in. And at least Obama, when he left office, gave us some hope that we would have a potential future to stay in Afghanistan that would allow us to mitigate our dependence upon Pakistan. But in the short term, and by short term, I actually could mean a decade or I could mean a year, is because you never know what, what Trump is going to tweet and then what he's going to have the rest of his uh, liquor cabinet come up with with a supporting policy. But if we're going to stay in Afghanistan, this is going to be the logistical constraint that we confront. I don't see anything that can really change that. The other thing that is very depressing, I think, from a point of view of a South Asianist, because we've been saying this forever, um, Pakistan is essentially engaging in nuclear coercion, right? Um, Pakistan has now for many decades concluded that since it has an army that cannot win a war, that the only way it can try to put pressure on India is by using jihadists under the umbrella of its ever-expanding nuclear, under the ever-expanding nuclear umbrella, which is, you know, uh, better than most. It now includes tactical, uh, or perhaps more appropriately called battlefield nuclear weapons. The brilliance of Pakistan's strategy is that it is unfailing, right? Whenever there's a terrorist attack here in India, Indians think really long and hard about what might be the, the look of the escalation ladder, right? It has been a very effective strategy at deterring India from punishing Pakistan for any of its terrorist actions. Now, one of the things that I find very bizarre, as someone who's been watching this region for some time, I all the time hear Indians say that Pakistan has nuclear weapons. I've never heard a Pakistani say, oh, but India has nuclear weapons. Why is that? Right? Presumably, the very same structures of deterrence that allow Pakistan to engage in these activities with impunity also allow India to pursue subconventional options. And this is something I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A. Uh, I, I hear a lot of conversations here in South Asia, particularly in India, about conventional and nuclear deterrence. I don't hear any conversations happening about subconventional deterrence. And in fact, whenever this comes up, uh, Indians seem to think that this is something that India is incapable of doing. Well, if you're incapable of doing it, why do you have raw at all? Are you paying them to eat doses for crying out loud? No, I, I mean, I, and I say this not to be a jerk, but this is, what, this is what intelligence agencies are supposed to do. So in thinking about full spectrum deterrence, you must consider subconventional deterrence. This is, this is not provocative in my way of thinking, this is just called logical. So thinking about the Pakistan puzzle, let's pretend that we could put ourselves outside of the logistical trap and we could somehow convince policymakers, particularly in Washington, that Pakistan is not too dangerous to fail. You would still, I submit to you, have a lot of difficulty getting anyone to sign up to do anything that's different. And why is that? Because at the end of the day, what is the American politician's worst fear? That there be another 9-11 committee commission report, it won't be called 9-11, it might be called, you know, 10-3 commission report, in which we have a scenario where the Americans have withdrawn aid from Pakistan, and we've lost our influence, we've lost our access, and, it, and a jihadist manages to get nuclear materials, weapons, and what have you, and the worst case scenario actually fructifies, right? So from, your, from the point of view of a risk-averse politician, they will do anything to avoid that outcome. And by the way, your politicians are no different from mine. I think it's kind of funny 
and I don't mean funny in a humorous way, I mean funny as in this is really insane, that India wants the United States to declare Pakistan to be a state sponsor of terror. Has your government done that yet? Why not? I mean, you're the most direct victim of their terror, and you can't get your parliamentarians to declare the state to be a state sponsor of terror. Well, imagine the difficulty that my politicians are in. So what, what would it take, right? What kind of Pakistani outrage would it take to knock an American legislator out of this pocket of, of fear and insouciance? Well, the analogy that I, that I give, um, if you were in DC 10 years ago, we actually used to have parking meters, right? So the way it would work, you put a quarter in, and if the thing worked, you got a parking space for 15 minutes. If the parking meter didn't work, maybe you got no minutes at all. So many people think of Pakistan as like a broken parking meter. You put a quarter in, you're supposed to get 15 minutes, maybe you'll get one. But it's a predictable broken meter that Pakistan is going to be a marginal satisfier. If you completely change the policy, you put a quarter in, and maybe you'll get negative 60 minutes. Right? So the risk averse policy maker is always going to err on the side of the status quo because they think that they can manage the status quo. Now the problem with this is that your average policymaker, particularly in the House of Representatives, they're there for two years. And so their horizon is incredibly short, right? Um, and then towards the end of that two years, they're already thinking about their, their next campaign. And then of course, the term in the Senate's quite a bit longer, it's six years. But you have this constant churn, this constant electoral cycle that comes up every two years. And this makes it really difficult from an organizational point of view to ever get a critical mass of people that want to do something different. And this is, this is on the legislative side itself. Leave aside the turbulence that happens on the, on the administration side, you know, with the person who's actually occupying the White House. And you know, when you kind of go through what else can Pakistan do, you're, you come up fairly stumped, right? We had bin Laden, who was hanging out just a leisurely stroll from Kakul. 9-11. Right. Most of 9-11's, you know, most of the, the planning of 9-11 had a very strong Pakistani footprint. And none of this is really enough to get people to think differently. So one of the things that I think our job as scholars, whether we're in, an, whether we're in the academy, whether we are in think tanks, is to really educate our leadership to think differently about this problem. Right? So I would say that Pakistan is the most stable instability. This idea that Pakistan is on the brink of collapse, the brink of failure, is actually what gives Pakistan so much purchase over us. But if we could convince the average policymaker, and this is a very big if, that Pakistan is, the, is not likely to fail, that in fact you can do a lot to that country, um, it's like when I was a kid, we had this toy called the Weeble. The Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. Pakistan is like a Weeble to me. Whether you're looking at the 1971 war in which it loses half of its population, look at the 2010 floods, various things that people have said would presage Pakistan's demise hasn't even had a dent on Pakistan. The place literally should be self-destructing if the pundits were correct but they're not correct, the place is very stable. So what would it look like? What would a world, what would a policy towards Pakistan look like if we could convince our policymakers to be more risk acceptant? Well, I think the first thing that we have to do is remove ourselves from Pakistan's coercion loop. And, and, and ultimately, how do we do that? Well, it's, it's surprisingly simple to this simpleton's mind. That is, we say to Pakistan, we're no longer going to try to arrogate to ourselves the ability to keep an eye on your nuclear problem. Quite frankly, if the Americans are going to tell me that this $34 billion has brought us access and influence, my response to that is you can keep this influence because under our watch and on our dime, they've proliferated their arsenal of nuclear weapons. Without this um, infusion of American funds, and money is fungible, 34 billion, I don't think Pakistan would be 
the rapid proliferator that it is today. Right? So I would argue that the American taxpayer, i.e. me, has underwritten the very tools by which Pakistan coerces us. So the, we have to get ourselves out of that coercion loop before we would be in a position to impose any costs upon Pakistan that are truly meaningful. I think the easiest way to do that is say, look, we know what your nuclear signature is, which in some ways we, we do to a first order approximation. And if any nefarious individual gets a hold of and uses your materials, we're gonna hold you responsible. I think it would also be very useful to say that if Pakistan is the first user of nuclear weapons, that the victim is not gonna be responding on their own. I think this is the kind of declaratory policy where we basically say whatever happens, it's your problem and you're gonna be held responsible. Christian, yeah. we'll, we'll need some time for the question answer. Yeah, I am, and so let me, let me just fast forward. So let's pretend that, that we could actually do this. What would some of these sanctions look like? Well, I'm gonna to submit to you, and we can detail them, we can talk about them. None of those sanctions are gonna matter, right? None of the sanctions that the US can actually impose upon Pakistan is going to change its behavior. The only thing that I think the United States has, and that's its sway at the IMF, right? Because right now what Pakistan does is whatever it wants to do, the army gets whatever part of the budget it wants, and it relies upon an IMF bailout. And even though it never it never, set, it never lives up to its own obligations under the IMF. The United States still tells the IMF to issue another tranche because it's too dangerous to fail. So I would submit to you that the only thing that we could really do to Pakistan that would in any way impose costs associated with this behavior is to withdraw support from the IMF. And in closing, let me make a very strong argument that if we don't do this, we will be picking up the bill of Pakistan's misadventures with China, right? So Pakistan says, we don't need you, we've got China. Well, that's, that's also called nonsense because Pakistan doesn't give grant aid, it gives loan aid. And all Pakistan has to do is look at Han Bin Toda, right? China is the one that's making money off of this, right? China will drive most of the benefit. What Pakistan will get is probably some suboptimal infrastructure. But the worst case scenario is, Gwadar is basically like Han Bin Toda. So if the Americans don't cut the Pakistanis off from the IMF, the American taxpayer is actually going to be subsidizing Pakistan's loan servicing to the Chinese. So I'm going to I'm going to leave that there. So it's not a you know it's not a very upbeat assessment, but um, I'm not known for being upbeat. But I think this is the only thing that we have that could possibly change Pakistan's behavior. Thank you.